Okay, I think we are going to start and I know there'll be more people joining us, but uh, we can't hold anymore uh, to wait for more people. And just for the sake of, of record, uh, we are recording um, this uh, webinar uh, this afternoon and I really would like uh, everybody to know that we are recording um, and I think uh, Alana has put uh, there a message to show that we are recording. Uh, so my name is Salome Bugwa. I work with Akidwa, the Migrant Women's Network in Ireland. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon in our webinar, you know, for our conference that we are actually going to discuss uh, about, uh, you know, women leadership with our theme, Beyond Bias and Barriers, and that migrant women leadership matters. Um, uh, just to say from the very outset that, uh, you know, 20, this year 2021 is a very significant year for um, our organization, Akidwa, as we turn, um, as we turn uh, the 20 years. So we have a lot of activities that we are planning uh, for this year, but as well, uh, we are collaborating with a few other organizations in some projects, uh, and we will actually be letting people know uh, through our database, you know, we, we normally communicate uh, through uh, the database that we have for the people whom we have uh, their email addresses on what is going on. So we have a huge line of activities uh, that are going to be actually executed by the organization uh, this year. As we all know, and some of you know, because they've been with us in this journey of 20 years, Akido has been championing work on human rights and gender equality in the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, for us, the International Women's Day this year is very significant because we mark two decades of our struggles and strength being a migrant women's network where we had actually to set the network and the platform itself uh, to give the women the opportunity to be able to talk for themselves uh, and to have that voice. Um, as you know, we've led many campaigns. You know, we have led campaigns on deportation. We have led campaigns on uh, female genital mutilation, which is still ongoing. Um, we've led so many other campaigns, including some of the work that we are doing now on the areas of employment and access to employment which is still a significant challenge uh, for many women out there. So our organization Akido has achieved quite a lot uh, for women and with women together, because we cannot take the pride and say that it's us, the staff, the board, who have actually achieved the, the, the achievements that we have achieved so far. But we have done this with many migrant women around the country in all the 26 counties and including Northern Ireland, we have linkages uh, with women, migrant women uh, that we work with. Um, the 2021 themes for International Women's Day choose to challenge, remind us that we are still very far much away from achieving gender equality. It also reminds us that actually we have worked very hard, you know, collaboratively with others and the women movement, uh, you know, of the 1960s, which actually comes even up to now in the, in the 21st century, has done a lot of work to be able to achieve what women globally have achieved. And indeed, we know of the achievement, for example, of the Irish women um, and what they have achieved in Ireland uh, before even the migrant came in, you know, the access to contraceptive uh, and all these other things that have been achieved recently, including the marriage equality and repeal the aid amendment. And we'll be hearing more from some of the women who have championed um, these causes and who, are, who actually continue to transform our world in a very significant way. Because when we achieve something, it's also said very, very strong message to other countries around the world and inform others on what we are doing as a country and as a society. And actually it motivates other people um, to be able to engage with the people who have been able to achieve. I remember, and I say this because I was in Morocco back in 2018. And in Morocco, the women, it's a time actually of the repeal the aid amendment. And in Morocco, women were trying to also see how they can um, access, have the access to abortion. And they were very, very excited when they heard that I was from Ireland and they, they, they actually saw Irish women as women who are very courageous, you know, to have achieved whatever they have achieved, you know, uh, for the time that they have been fighting for this kind uh, of equality. And just to say that, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are still so many biases and challenges that still remain. Indeed, our world is still so much um, bombarded with the stereotypes and attitudes 
attitude towards women, you know, the, the, the gender roles that still continue to hinder women from progressing, the attitude mainly from the patriarchal society, but also from what is actually still going on, on the way we are socialized and the way we socialize girls and boys differently, that still continue to create this inequality even when these young girls grow to be big women and, and moving forward. So looking at how women have come, how far women have come, in particular looking at Ireland and the situation of Ireland, and us as an organization positioning ourselves into that situation. This afternoon, we are going to hear from three phenomenal women, women who have fought so hard for equality and justice in Ireland. Um, women, um, women actually who have uh, uh, you know worked so hard uh, to make things happen so we'll be hearing from them um and uh, each or, each one of them will actually present uh, for a few minutes and then we'll then later have a panel so, so we will be looking at biases and challenges, but what achievement have these women achieved? What, what have they done extraordinarily? Or sometimes people don't see what they have done. So we'll be hearing from them and we'll be learning from them. And then we'll come back to a panel of where uh, we will discuss things in, in depth. So to start with, we are going to start with Professor Kathleen Lynch. Uh, she's a sociologist. She's a, she has devoted her life work in promoting equality and human rights and social justice through education and research. She established the UCD, you know, Equality Study Center in 1990 and actually had the opportunity of working with Professor Kathleen. She actually uh, inspires me quite a lot. I remember when I joined Equality Studies and I had to be treated very differently because uh, you know, I had to pay the international fee. And one of the equality battle that I saw from firsthand experience with Professor Kathleen Lynch was my own battle. So I actually um, recognize her as a, as, a, as a key leader you know, in Ireland, in particular on the area of education, uh, and also the way she put forward you know, the, the, the role of women and importance of having women into education. I know also Kathleen have worked very hard um, in uh, promoting uh, the outreach programs to be able to ensure that more women are supported. Uh, can everybody hear? Because I see some people saying they can't hear. Can people hear? Yes, me. Yeah, so, hear um, well. Okay, so yeah, some people are saying that they can't hear. But just to say that, um, I would like to uh, invite Catherine to be able to address us this afternoon. Again, we are here to celebrate uh, the struggles and the strength of women. Um, and we will actually hear what, um, you know, what have been achieved, for example, in Ireland, and what are the still barriers and challenges that still remain that we need to work on. Professor Catherine, thank you very much. Welcome, and thank you for agreeing to speak in our seminar today. Uh, thank you very much, Salome. I'm delighted to be here to speak. And first of all, congratulations to you all on your own achievements, which I think are remarkable. And I won't go into the racial history of Ireland, but let's say it isn't exactly known for its really racial justice. So I think you achieved in Akiva an awful lot against the odds. <coughs> remarkable achievements, even by global standards. So I am going to talk a little bit, as per what I was asked to do, about my own experience. Now, I can share my slides with you if that's okay um uh would you is that okay and uh, i because i have written down i sat down this morning and said right what am i going to talk about what am i going to say so here is i'm start with who i am and am i right now um yeah. about struggles for social justice in my experience and where i've come from i'm going to talk about where i'm from and how long it took and what i've learned and i hope what i hope would help other people um just to say here, uh, I am from rural Ireland, which is not exactly known, let me say, for its radicalism or its egalitarianism, or indeed, it's justice for women. And I suppose that was my beginning, being aware of being a second class citizen as a woman. And I was very aware, even as a small child, of the struggle to get out. I knew, and I could see all around me, how hard women worked, and how little they got, and how subservient they were. So I'm not from, I'm from a farm. I worked on that farm as a child. So I don't have, I, I didn't come, I didn't, they were, my family weren't poor by our standards, but neither were they very wealthy. So 
I have great respect still, I should say, for manual work because I did a lot of it when I was young. And I could see all the transgender, um, ableist, ethnic and other injustices. But the thing I noticed was they were never named and they were never claimed and they were never challenged. So for me, when I got a chance to stay in education, which I did, and I thank my parents for that, we, I got the opportunity to learn a language, the power of naming. Because many of the people around uh, me in the, in the country and indeed throughout the cities as well, didn't have the language. <coughs> people spoke about you in your behalf, taking away your voice. For example, in a very simple thing, women who worked on the land at the time I was a child and for many years afterwards, for 20 more years afterwards, they weren't even counted as a full agricultural unit in terms of production. And so they are counted, I think, as 1.6. And they were the same as a boy. And it shows you how lowly their status was, despite the fact they worked inside and outside the house. And the women who resisted injustices, I suppose I'm from County Clare, and Edna O'Brien, the great writer, is from Clare, and not that far, although the woman, she's a lot older than me, but I knew of her. And I knew and could see how she was demonized and how people spoke about her. <coughs> the immoral, dangerous people to be avoided, not normal. So the woman who spoke was the woman to be avoided. So I became and was becoming, if you like, an educated to be a middle class heterosexual woman. And you have to learn to speak. And I think that's still true of a lot of young girls. They have to learn to speak and not be afraid to speak because the freedom to speak, if and when it existed, was seen very much for upper class women. I think Edna O'Brien talks about the fact that her mother regarded writing as a sin. And, and, and it was really only the very elite women who actually entered the public domain. And if working class women spoke in trade union organizing, they were rough or lacking in refinement. And I think the bulk of women, young women in Irish society, are still controlled by that good girl narrative, compliance and silence. The impact of the long arm of male-dominated intellectual thought. And it's always equated with the churches, but I'd like to remind you of Aristotle, who claimed in, in his book on politics that silence gives grace to women. And Rousseau, the great French philosopher, is almost like he inspired the Irish constitution because he feared that intellectual development of a woman would lead to neglect of her duty as wife and mother. And as you know, we have that constitutional clause uh, <coughs> in, in Ireland that it refers to this kind of thinking. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the other thing to claim, I'm just looking here for uh, showing my slides here so that you can see them more fully um, uh, here. The claiming the right to be an intellectual was a big issue because uh, I think that, and this I think is a class issue and a race issue still for people who are immigrant, although I was delighted in the first Black Studies class that Evan Joseph taught in UCD, the majority of whom there were young Black women, there were long Black men as well, but the majority were young women, and how confident a lot of them were in speaking. I hope they don't lose their confidence in Ireland, because Ireland teaches a lot of the time women to be quiet literally to be quiet and not to speak loudly. So to become an academic was not something I planned. I had no clear path or anything. And I was always that like you have the imposter syndrome because I didn't come from an academic family and my family were farmers, they worked on the land. So you have that fear of failing, of not being good enough to be an academic for a long time. And I, that's where I learned the importance of solidarity. I had great friends, especially in the United States, I have to say and in the UK and to a lesser degree in mainland Europe, because we weren't as well connected for language reasons, who, who taught me to undo that fear and to learn how to speak and to learn not to be afraid. I'm not saying I didn't learn it from other people. My own personal background was very important and my family believed in me at a personal level. But you also need uh, a consolidation of that from uh, the public domain and people you work with. And also, I was also living often in fear of loneliness. I think that's very important to acknowledge. Because often I think people think, oh, people like you, you know, you had it easy or you great support all the time. Not at all. A lot of the time your fear of being alone and being left alone and being isolated remains with you. Because when you're striding out and it's not the norm, uh, you, it is sometimes a lonely place. I campaigned a lot of things, actually, and I just thought I'd mention a few of them. And actually, I started when I was very young, campaigning against the suffering of animals on the farm. I want to go into the details. But I won a very small battle when I was about 11 or 12. 
And those of you who are not from the ag farming wouldn't realize what, what happened about dehorning calves and things. Anyway, I won the battle. And that actually had a very profound impact on me vis-a-vis -vis men, which is my father, and actually because it changed the way we did certain things on the farm. Then I worked in a factory when I was 19, and I was sort of involved with organizing an unofficial strike for which I got fired, along with three other people, two, one woman and two men. It was also very interesting because it taught me the importance of organization. And in my case, maybe not very smart organization, but we thought we could kind of win this battle, you know, with our unofficial strike. Then I lived and worked with homeless people, young women particularly, and campaigned around social welfare rights because at the time, if you left school at 15 or 16, as which people did, you didn't have the right to social welfare as a young woman. And it actually was a major factor in precipitating a lot of young women into prostitution, street prostitution at the time. And I was involved in tenants' rights and other campaigns in UCD. But so I just want to say that the things that I learn, the power is not given. People who are in power don't give it up. It's struggled for and it's taken. And women's struggles are not one on goodwill alone, and maybe sometimes, or by polite conversation. They come after you have won the struggle. And certainly that was my experience. We had a major legal action in UCD, which I led, collecting data about the fact that so many women had not been promoted over a two year period. And we tried all the official channels. We were polite, we brought things to meetings, we made representations. We went through all the official channels, nothing happened until at the time, you could do it. I collected data and showed, and it gave it to journalists which appeared in the front of the Irish Times the day of a governing authority meeting. And there was absolute, what would I say, uh, it led to action because they were so embarrassed by it. And what I'm saying is women win when they become a force and a power to be reckoned with politically, institutionally, and financially. And I think it's people often think if you speak lightly and politely, yes but you need the other actions as well. And I suppose what I want to recognize here is not all women are in this position to fight. There is the intersectionality of injustices. Women in skin are black or brown, experience color-based racism in Ireland in a way that white women don't. People with women with physical disabilities are more likely to be poor and low wage. They're also likely to respect and less respect in terms of their attractiveness or as potential mothers, which I'd want to talk about. Lone parent women are among the poorest and the highest rates of poverty. Intellectually disabled women are vulnerable to be preyed upon sexually, financially. Older women and single women experience profound disrespect in this country. Old bag, old hag, old witch, or single women are defined by what they're not. They're not married. It's like left on the shelf. These kind of, so I'm not saying that all women are the same, but I do want to comment something here where I think women do share something in common. And that is uh, the pandemic. I want to comment briefly on the pandemic because the pandemic highlights something that women have in common, which is the fact that they are all do care work disproportionately more than men. And within the census, a care is defined with somebody who does regular unpaid personal help for a friend or family member with a long-term illness, health problem or disability. But this definition excludes the vast majority of women because who are carers of children and carers of children and adults about 1.2 or 1.3 million, most of whom are women. And women are almost two and a half times as likely to be carers of children than men, but carers are even counted in the national census. And it's at that deep institutional level, that is in 19, 2016. So I think there is this essentialist view of femininity, that women are naturally caring, going back to even Rousseau, the idea that they should be naturally at home. And there has been a survey for example, showing in the, by the Central Statistics Office, women are much more likely than men to take on homeschooling, caring, cooking, even when working at home. They're also, since the pandemic, women are four times more likely than men to, operate, to rate their life satisfaction as a group, uh, and uh, compared with what it was in 2018, while men were two and a half times more right, likely to relate it as low quality of life is low compared to 2018. And that's an enormous change. And it shows you that women are very heavily overburdened in the pandemic. They're more likely to be depressed and lonely. And almost contrary to what a lot of popular media say, oh, everyone loves working at home. Almost half the women who didn't work at home before the pandemic report they would like to return to their place of work. 
even maybe on different bases, but they wanted to return it. But it's, it's the same is only true for not for under one third of men. And of course, that women are much more likely to be subjected to, they're more likely to subject to violence at home. And their consumption of alcohol, tobacco, and junk food, uh, food has increased a lot more than men. So women are the default carers in our society. And I think that has made them very, very vulnerable. And that's true, all types of women, not regardless of your color, most people are in the women are in that position. I just wanted to say this. I think, yes, there are distributive justice issues, there's recognition of women, and there's power issues. But there is also a huge affective inequality in the doing and receiving of care, which is a serious problem for women across the world. The report by, uh, some of you may know it, by Oxfam in 2020 about the world and women's role in the world shows that women are in fact seriously penalized throughout the world because of their care role. And, and I think it relates too to something else, and I can't have time to discuss it, but the definition of masculinity. What does it mean to be an ideal man in Western society? It means being dominant. The idealized masculinity operates within an ethic of control and power, and men are socialized to think of avoiding vulnerability, getting and being in power. And, and I think that, that we, we need to talk about masculinity if we're talking about patriarchy, because if we socialize, as Salome said at the beginning, our sons and our daughters to accept and our sons to be dominant position, the woman always has to be the person to give up her job if they have children, et cetera, or go part time. We are reinstating the very patriarchy and subordinating women. And, and what I'm saying is there's a moral imperative on women to care, to think of the vulnerable other that doesn't apply to men. And yes, I think everybody should care. I'm not saying that care doesn't matter. I'm just finishing a book on care and capitalism. So I think it matters an awful lot. I think capitalism undermines care. But I still think we need to look at the gender division of labor and the, the equation of femininity with relationality binds girls. Girls define themselves relationally as was still true. Without, and often the problem with that is we don't have public services and care services. So women then lack time and money that needs to become leaders. As I say, women's unwaged care labor and domestic labor facilitates men's public power, which they then use to dominate and control women. So uh, what lessons have I learned just have to finish? I think that you're always learning. And that's what I learned, I suppose, most of all. There's always some injustice you do not know or you haven't experienced. I started in equality studies, learning from people with disabilities. We had a lot to learn from travelers, from black people, ethnic minorities, refugees, asylum seekers. So there is humility and listening, and that you can lead from the side and behind. I feel very strongly about that, as well as from the front. You don't always have to be the person who's on the front page of the magazine or the front page on television or whatever. You can lead in other ways, but you have to be organized and you need solidarity. Otherwise, you will be isolated and very easily picked off. You have to create alliances, and keeping differences and divisions, I think, in organizations, private, especially where you have common cause. And to lead on social justice is to put your head above the parapet, means overcoming fear and being judged and often disliked. I think that has to be recognized. Speaking truth to power does not make you popular. And it means sometimes you won't get that promotion or that privilege that you think you deserve. So just finally, I think to keep up the struggle, we need to believe that things are possible. Because if you don't have the ideals and if you don't believe that equality between men and women and all people are more than possible, then it won't happen. Believing it is making it, you know, faking it is making it. And it is true. I think even people told us we could never establish equality studies in recent years. It was a ridiculous idea. Nobody was supporting it if we did it. Women's studies, I'm sure I'll tell you, is a state. And then you need moral commitment. And I think you need moral courage as well at the individual level, as well as solidarity with others, and always working in teams to organize for it to happen. The danger of the solar run, the egotist who thinks they alone are going to achieve something. Recognize their sacrifice. And I suppose I'd end by saying means to educate our children, grandchildren, sisters, brothers, fathers, partners, whoever, to fight for social justice at home. I mean, in the family and demand that their children and others are educated to be agents of equality and social justice in society. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kant Catherine. I think we've learned quite a lot from you. You know, you have taken us through your journey uh, from where you started to where you are. And I actually always tell women that we are all leaders because leadership starts within our own self and from our own families. Uh, you know, as carers of our children and our families, uh, you know, uh, the work that we do even within our own society that, uh, you know, uh, people can still find their position of leadership in that and we've heard how you started campaigning uh, from you know campaigning for animals uh, animals life actually uh, suffering of animal which which is actually quite significant that it has even brought you to where you are and then getting to the whole area of education and you believe actually for for the lack of the voice in particular for women and and that being heard uh, we will be coming back to discuss some of the things that you have raised in particular the intersectionality because actually that's where we come in we know we Women are not a homogeneous group, and it's very important that we talk about this intersectionality and how the whole issue of race, gender, and, and you know, disability and all that, you know, come into play when we talk about gender equality and women finding a voice, because you also mentioned about the voice and how the voice it's, uh, is important. Your views on the pandemic and the caring role of the woman is actually very, very significant and very much varied at this time of the uh, pandemic, um, but also the tips that you have given us towards the very end, uh, in particular in having that belief, yes, that you can still achieve gender equality. So we'll come back to that um, towards the, 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 the end uh, when we open the panel. Now I would want to actually welcome uh, Dr. Colette Delikeni. Dr. Colette Delikeni is actually an expert. You need and, to install Samsung. And, and an educator. Um, and an educator. So she's actually an expert and an educator in cross-cultural social work, uh, currently lecturing uh, in social care in the Doc Institute of Technology. I actually just noted one thing because uh, Dr. Colette has actually been ch championing even speaking out and, and raising that voice on the issues of direct provision from her social work uh, work no, in Ireland and what she has been doing. And in 2014, for example, she was quoted by Irish Times where she said, the voice of the social workers is as silenced and oppressed as that of the asylum seekers. That was back in 2014. And she had actually called the Minister for Justice at the time to be able to come up with a group uh, working to look into the situations of asylum seekers and their families in direct provision. That was in 2014. And now we see actually in 2020, 2021, the issues of direct provision are still being discussed. But she had championed this even during that time. Uh, Dr. Coletta, you are very much welcome. And we actually look forward to hearing your presentation and what you have actually to share with us. So you're very much welcome. Thank you, Salome. Uh, and thank you for having me. Um, it's great to see everybody. Uh, I just want to share one, um, one, one slide that I have. I'm not the best at using this, so please bear with me. I will, I will get there. Uh, I just want to share an image. Can people see that image? Yes. Uh, Salome? Yeah, we yes. can see it. You can see that image. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Pro Professor Kathleen Lynch for her presentation and thank you very much for sharing. I want to acknowledge all of you and thanks Salome and Akibwa for, uh, for um, asking me to come and share my story, uh, which I really capture in this image, in this one image. I will put it down in a minute when I have just finished explaining it. The, the image for me, um, speaks to me around women's issues and we issues for for people day to day on a day to day basis generally so for me when i look uh, at the issue of equality of women and equality in general i like to use this image because it always depicts the the different the differences in how life is so the reality sometimes is that that short person there can't enjoy uh, what others are enjoying in the football uh, pitch 
the the one that is right at the top is not even looking back on the on the guy or the lady who is down at the bottom and then you have the tree there in that equality but still we see that there's still somebody who is just um below and they are they are not even attempting to to hold the fence to see and then we see the, the sign on equity and well that small small lady or fellow seems to have gone up and then we see liberation where the barriers are taken away and and when the barrier is not there everybody everybody can see and everybody can enjoy but that is not how life is life is not like that for women and life is not always like that i will try and, and tell you my story of how I came to Ireland, just to situate myself and where I am at now. I'm very impressed that now as Salome is a genius. She managed to find something I did in 2014, which I had forgotten about myself. Um, so I came to Ireland, not as a lecturer at DKIT. I didn't come to lecture at, at DKIT. My journey began as a volunteer. I came to Ireland as a volunteer in 1988. So I came to volunteer to work in the Lash community. And the Lash community is a community for people with intellectual disabilities. So I had finished my, um, my A-levels, which is the equivalent to the living certificate. And I, I was always a wanderer. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. So I went to volunteer in my own country, Zimbabwe, just get a leprosy mission to work with lepers, just, just doing odd jobs, anything I was asked to do. While I was there, I came across a man called John Vanier. John Vanier is the founder of Lash Communities uh, internationally. So he was giving a talk um, in the local town and I went to listen to him. And I was very impressed about what he was talking about. He was talking about the cry of the poor for relationships. And he, he was talking about the fact that we can learn so much from people with intellectual disabilities. And this concept just grabbed my, my, my mind and it challenged me. Because back at home in Zimbabwe, I suppose uh, people with intellectual disabilities it is, are not seen as people you can learn something from, but they're seen as people we need to help and support. So I went and spoke to him afterwards and I said, where can I go to live and experience what you have been talking about? And he said to me, lush communities are all over the world. You can go to France, to anywhere, but I'll direct you to Ireland because in Ireland, you won't need to learn a language. You can fit in and blend in very easily. So off I came to Ireland from the, the, the leprosy mission, and I landed uh, in Cork uh, in the Lash community, just a community where you live with inter people with intellectual disabilities. They come from the institutions and you live and support each other. I did that for two years. And fast track, it was time my visa for, for coming to Ireland had finished. But I must say on that point that when during the two years i was in lash a lot of people used to say to me oh where are you from and i'd say i'm from zimbabwe and say oh are you at university and i'd say no i am doing voluntary work and they'd say oh so it was strange for people that i came to ireland to do voluntary work because that's not back in 1988 that's not how things were irish people went to my country to build houses as missionaries and etc. So this was very strange and has always been strange for people. Oh, how come you came to Ireland to do voluntary work? I like to really say that I enjoyed doing voluntary work and I get, got so much out of it. But when I was doing it, I never knew that it would grow, it would build into something. So one day I took, I was with the folks from Lash in a pub because we were waiting to go in to see a circus. And I came across this doctor who saw us. We were sitting in a space 
and we were having some coke. We were not drinking pints or anything. We were drinking some coke and some soft drinks. And she was amazed because back in the day, there were very few black people around to see that these guys were making a lot of noise because people with intellectual disabilities, if they're happy, they're happy. They laugh and they laugh aloud. And if, if they are sad, they're sad. And some of them were rocking in the chair. So this woman thought, what is going on here? Who is this black woman with these children? It, it just looked very strange. And she came to talk to me. And when I was talking to her, I told her that, oh, I had finished my time in Lush and I was preparing actually to go back to my country, but I'd love to do a profession of caring for people, to, to work actually in that area as a profession. She directed me to UCC and she said, do you know there's a university here where you can go to study? I had never thought of that. And I went, the, the application that had closed for, for that day, but the, the secretary was very kind and said, we have closed the application today, but go quick and do your application and bring it back today. You can't bring it tomorrow. And when you bring up today, then we can make a case and submit it. I was invited to the interviews. They, they wanted um, 12 people and there was 200 applicants. I got on the course only on the basis that I had experience of doing voluntary work, prior experience of having done voluntary work. So my, even though my grades, my A-level grades were good, but the fact that I had given to the community, I had done something voluntarily meant to, the, to those who were reviewing my, my application that I was dedicated to social work and that I, I could be a candidate for social work. So, but during that time, we used to be given 20 pounds a week because we used to stay in the community and everything was catered for. So I actually was just chancing my arm. I didn't have money to go to college. So I went back to the college and I said, thank you for the place you offered me. I have to give it back actually because I can't afford to go. Uh, I, I didn't think I'll get it. And they said, no, no, Colette, you, you did so well in your interview. We have to have you. So the, I was offered a scholarship and started my social work. Why am I telling you that this story? Because I just think that sometimes, sometimes when we don't know, for me, there is no formula. Life has no formula. Life takes us and can take us on so many paths. Um, but my path was that I started just like that. And then I started my social work until I got to study to PhD level. I tell this story to inspire, to hopefully to inspire you and to inspire migrant women who probably think there's nothing for me, that there's something for everybody. I always think that we all, there's something for everybody. And as long as we, we are open to discovering things, I think opportunities can come uh, our way without us even expecting. I know that there are inequalities, as Professor Kathleen Lynch has said, yes, and those inequalities will always be there, will always exist. Along with my lovely journey of being embraced by Irish society and supported in my education, I have suffered a lot of challenges in terms of racism. I'm the only black lecturer at Dundalk Institute of Technology, we have over 500 lecturers here, but I've experienced racism from students and I've experienced a lack of support from the, the powers that be. But I, I, I don't give up. I, I love life and I just think life is there for, to, be, to be enjoyed. So when I am down, when I suffered immense racism, unfortunately, I have to say it, but I took on the establishment and I won my case. So again, why am I telling you that? I'm not telling you that because I'm trying to be pompous or anything, but I'm telling you that, that, that when you believe in something, when you follow your dream or when you follow your, your, when you follow your principles and your values, you, you get there. I mean, it was a very difficult time for me to be alone. And when I experienced this racism, it was a case that students who 
I thought I was teaching about values of care were racist and said racist remarks about me as a lecturer. And I thought justice was supposed to be served, but it wasn't because life doesn't work like that. But I fought for it and I got it. I have done some work supporting uh, women in direct provision. Direct provision for me is a system that oppresses everybody who is in it. It is, we have been told, we all know, that is the next Magdalene Laundries. We have been, we know, we are all aware. The white paper has been published recently, but we have to wait and see what that will, will, will bring for, for women. But I've always wanted to, to fight for justice. When I can't stand an injustice, when I see an injustice, I can't just sit back and look at it. It doesn't matter where it's going to lead me. I have to put my own voice in there. So I just also want to say, I think even women, we are resilient. Resilience is the word that comes to my mind when I think about women. I think we are so resilient, we are able to multitask and able to, to draw strength from various sources. But I just want to encourage all of us that for me, it's, it's good to keep going, never give up, never give up because there is always a way. Where there is a will, there is always a way, a way. For me, as a migrant woman, the intersectionality between race and gender has always been a challenge. I remember when I started working in Ireland back in the, in the 1990s as a social worker, I would pull out at a house to go into a, a house for a home visit. And back in the day, there were no black people. So people would say, oh God, it's a black woman. Oh, she's the social worker. So it's a black woman who's a social worker. And sometimes taking children from their families, I, rem I always remember an incident that made me laugh. I had gone with the daddy because there was a child at risk in a, in a home. And my role was to go and take the child. And the guards were there to protect what we were doing because they were so there was there was there were things that were going on that were not good at the house when i took the child and ran to my car the whole community was wandering outside a black woman is stealing a child they didn't know what was going on because again when people see me whether i like it or not they see the black first before they see a doctor or philosophy they see the black first before they see before they see anything but that's not that's not that, that you can make that a problem but you can also make it a, a, you can make make it a, a something that you can work with i mean i have found it difficult but in those difficulties in those challenges i don't give up i just keep going how am i doing for time salome um you have actually two seconds i have two seconds yeah I just keep going and I just want, in my two seconds, I just want to say something to, 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 to the ladies that please, self-care. Mental health is a big issue. It's a big issue for women. We experience, we, men experience mental health too, but I just think we multitask so many things. We always have so many balls in the air. So I just want to, to call out my, 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 my message for women for today is self-care, time out, go walk, walk, have, just get some time for yourself. Because sometimes we are consumed. I have three children. And when my children were growing, I was doing my PhD, minding three children who were at the, at the same time, um, at the same time uh, teenagers, and, and then trying to, to do a full-time job. And now they've all grown and left. And I just feel, God, how did I ever do that? But as women, we do. We do it for the love of the children. We do it for the love of everything. We do it for love of care. But I just want to remind us to look after ourselves. Do mind yourself and look after yourself as yourselves. Because if you can't look after yourselves, you run out of esteem and then you can't do anything at all. 
So thank, thank you again to Salome for inviting me to speak. I have so much to say, but I had to try and take from here, there, and everywhere. Thank you for listening to me and for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Colette. We've actually learned a lot from you from uh, coming with the love of volunteering in Ireland and ending up as a social worker. Uh, it's really, really a journey that you have gone through and you are reminding us as well the importance of volunteering and standing up. Uh, we've also had again from you about the intersectionality in particular between race and gender. And we are also reminded, I think it's this week where Megan Marcos spoke about uh, the identity and how people view uh, other people and so most of the time we are not actually confident to talk about these issues you know and yet it's happening the issues of attitude towards others because of how they look uh, and in particular you know how that impact on women and these biases that continue to hinder women from progressing and advancing We've had so much from not only social workers, but also people in different profession, pro professions from um, the migrant community on how they are looked down upon when they're in the duty of care. They look different or they, they, you know, they, they have disability or they are coming from you know, a different uh, perspective or background. So it's very, very important that we, we, we use our voice like you have said, but also at the same time we stand up and uh, mainly like what Catherine said even earlier, uh, being able to voice out and being able to speak out, uh, to name things out, uh, so if we are actually going to achieve beyond, uh, beyond where we are and going beyond these biases and barriers that we continue to experience. Experience. I'm going to call our final speaker a phenomenal woman. Most of you know her, and many people actually know her. Um, the Alpha Smith, who is the director, who was actually the former director, he was, she was the founder and director of the Women Education Research, Resource and Research Center in UCD. She was also the co-director of Together for Yes. We know about Together for Yes because it's not very long ago. Um, and she also was a strategic advisor for the marriage equality. Uh, so she have actually worked on so many campaigns, you know, the campaign on divorce. And actually when we were looking for people to speak in our conference today, you know, we felt that uh, Alpha Smith will be very ideal to be in our midst because she'd been able actually to face most of the biases uh, that, uh, that affect women from progressing and from advancing and that, you know, we can learn a lot from her. So Alpha Smith, I really welcome you and it's, it's really great to have you here. You're very much welcome to address us this afternoon. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Salome. And just first of all, to say to everybody, a very happy International Women's Day week. It's not over. It shouldn't be a day. It should be at least a week. In fact, you know, from my point of view, I think we should have International Women's Day and week all year round because the situation of, of women globally is such that that's actually what we need and I do want to apologize to everybody um, for, for not having been able to be here at two o'clock and I'm particularly sorry to have missed hearing Kathleen, Kathleen Lynch, uh, long-time colleagues as we were uh, in UCD in equality studies and Kathleen and me in women's studies and sharing the same corridor and I don't know what not for many years. So I'm very sorry to have missed that and very glad to have caught uh, Coletta. Um, Coletta, I could just go on listening to you. You are warm and wonderful and inspiring. And I think to myself, I don't know how, I don't know how you did all that you did and coped with the racism that you were experiencing all the time you were um, at, at university, raising three children and, you know, looking then for a job and uh, doing your voluntary work. I mean, it really is just uh, amazing and remarkable. And I'm sure um, that, you know, everybody joins with me in saying you are one woman for one woman. You really are. But I also know that that is very true of so many, all the women really, who are part of this today. And I know that from uh, a long time friendship with, with Salome and, and how difficult um, those trajectories have been for so many women. 
I just want to say though that I was asked to talk about in 10 minutes uh, my experience of the women's movement which goes back like about 35 or 40 years and also to talk about women's studies in UCD and also to talk about the marriage equality and repeal campaigns and also to talk about um, a bias and prejudice. Now there's no way I can do all of these things at all ever uh, but to do it in 10 minutes is ridiculous but I'm going to have a bit of a bash at, at flying through all of them and I'd be very grateful Salome if you give me a big wave when um, when I've got one minute left. Um, you know during the women's movement here started in the 19 early 1970s and I was ill during the 1970s for several years. I had a job in UCD but I was ill and I was ill with very severe mental health problems and at that time of course and it's still the case today but even more so then mental health issues were very severely stigmatized so it wasn't at all an easy time and it wasn't an easy time for my family. Nobody could name the fact that I was really the crazy daughter. And there was, there were, it, I experienced a lot of difficulties with my own family at that time. Uh, and then coming towards the end of the 70s, um, I decided that I would have a baby. Now I had been married to somebody else for six months and was having a baby with a, a, another man. And in Ireland, of course, at that time, this was absolutely unheard of that you would, and particularly unheard of for a middle-class uh, girl in my environment. And people kept saying to me, but you'll have the baby adopted. And I say, no, I will not. And, you know, just when we think of all the terrible revelations that have come out, I must have been, and I was among that first generation of women who were standing there and saying, no, um, I want to have this child. I can't get a divorce because we don't have divorce. So I'm going to have this child with my current partner. Um, I, much later after that, uh, I came out as lesbian, which also wasn't something that nice, polite, middle-class girls were uh, expected to do. And as I was being a very, uh, quiet, I think, academic in UCD, the women's movement was bursting, erupting out all around me. And I was at home a lot of the time, being ill and looking after my, my little baby, my little girl. But I was reading and watching and listening and thinking, what these women are talking about, that's my life. They're talking about how I need to think my life, rethink my life as a woman. We were so restricted, we were so limited in our everyday lives, so limited in our ambitions, so limited in our dreams. And yet I was a very privileged woman. I was privileged because of my social class and I was privileged because of my whiteness and I was privileged because of the part of the world I lived in relatively, in fact, uh, not maybe very wealthy at that time in Ireland, but certainly relatively speaking wealthy. Nonetheless, I became really engaged with the women's movement. And I'm just going to tell you some of the issues that were worked on. And these were the issues that I was reading about and seeing women out on the streets marching and realizing that I needed to, to be out there too, to fight not just for myself, but for all of the women who had been and were restricted and limited and boundaried and oppressed, not being able to be our full selves. And the Irish women, the Irish women, uh, the Irish women, Irish women united their charter, uh, which was given out in 1975 very bravely. And it's really interesting to look at it now and to think about how much has been done and how much has not been done, how much is still to be done and how some women have benefited, but probably the majority of women here and globally have not. There were all kinds of legal issues we had to look at. Uh, we couldn't have bank accounts on our own. Pensions were terrible. We were taxed along with our husbands if we were married. We couldn't uh, claim at that stage the um, uh, child children's allowance on our own account. That was could be claimed by uh, our, our, our husband. We didn't have contraception. We wanted Irish Women United called for free legal contraception. 
Um, and that took years and years and years to come. In fact, it is still, we still don't have free contraception. And that was one of the things that our Minister for Health at the time of repeal the eighth promised us we would have, and we're still fighting for that. And I think that one of the great discoveries of the 20th century for women was uh, the advent of contraception. I think that has been hugely important uh, for us. And yet we still don't have free contraception in this country. Irish Women United also very very interestingly called for an adequate place to live and when you think about where we are now in 2021 um, how many you know the, the enormity of homelessness in this country and the disgrace of the fact that 10,000 um, uh, you know 10,000 people homeless and children homeless it's absolutely extraordinary that way back then we were absolutely determined to call for uh, an adequate place to live for every woman and for her family. State support for motherhood and for parenthood, childcare. Um, please don't tell me that we have resolved any of those issues because we absolutely have not. Um, we wanted equality in education and we wanted it to be secular and we wanted it to be co-educational and we wanted it to be state finance so an end to uh, private education we wanted of course equal pay and access to training and to all jobs and decent working conditions maybe you know still so important we still don't have equal pay and by no means the majority uh, of people working in frontline and essential services really do not have uh, decent working conditions we wanted statutory maternity leave. And while we do have maternity leave, just think about our Minister for Justice at the moment, where we're told that, oh, well, uh, yes, she will be able to take maternity leave, but we're going to have to change the constitution. I mean, it's extraordinary that we're only thinking of doing this in 2021. Um, and we wanted, among other things, Irish Women United called for a right of women to self-determine sexuality. And that was another way of talking about women's right to be lesbian. But it was also making a very important point about sexuality and that we as women needed to be able to control our sexual and indeed our reproductive lives. And these are battles that have gone on throughout the 20th and in the first century. There were certain things not in there. Um, and I've campaigned over the years on violence against women, and um, we are still fighting that. We know that during COVID-19 here and around the world, we've seen this terrible upsurge in violence against women. And that is a hugely uh, important issue for us to, to focus on. And I certainly would like to think that we will, um, that there will be more commitment to doing that following the awful damage that has been done to women uh, during COVID. Uh, but, you know, in all of that, I was very conscious that, um, it, in a sense, we could only call for all of those things and fight for all of those things because it's going back to something Coletta said and that um, I think Salome and uh, Kathleen have both said as well, that we could only do those things by working together, by coming together to seek to achieve um, the goals and the gains that we wanted to. And that stayed true. So, and, and came, I think, to be seen very, very clearly in the campaigns that we fought around abortion in 83, in 1992, and again in 2002. Uh, and in the two campaigns that we had to fight around divorce, that it was people coming together from different sectors and across different, um, different areas of interest that we were able to uh, eventually um, achieve, win those, win those victories. And it was very clear in repeal of the, the um, marriage equality campaign. And I particularly want to say something about repeal of, of the eighth, because that was a very difficult, um, it was a very difficult issue for us to address in Ireland. Abortion had been so uh, deeply, deeply stigmatized. And we, as everybody I think here knows, that we lived in a country where we said we have no abortion. We exported the problem at the rate of 12 women uh, a week over to, uh, to the UK, or 12 women a day over to the UK. 
And I want particularly to say that that coming together, bringing organisations um, together to work for appeal was very, very slow at the start. We started with just 12 organisations back in, it was actually, um, I think it was 2012. And I want to pay tribute to Salome and to Akidwa because Akidwa was one of those first 12 organisations that very bravely stood up to fight for this basic freedom that uh, women need in our lives, that freedom to control our own uh, reproduction and freedom of control, freedom of our own bodies, basically. Now, I know that those campaigns were the culmination of a very long process of social change in Ireland, but they were absolutely, both of those campaigns, marriage equality and repeal, were driven by really strong grassroots social movements, just as the early days of the women's liberation movement back in the 1970s were driven by the grassroots. And I think that I can't stress that enough that of course we want change to come from the top, from government, but fundamentally people getting out there on the streets, women and women and men and straight people and lesbians and gays and trans people getting out there on the streets, working together, collaborating, cooperating, uh, drawing in allies, that has been absolutely crucial in changing Ireland. People often say to me, well, you know, the island I grew up in was obviously a very, very different place from the place it is today. It is very far from perfect. We have many, many, many problems and in deep inequalities, but uh, we have changed a great deal. And we didn't just change the face of Ireland. Actually, we were about changing its foundations and its values and saying, if we are for equality, we have to mean it at every single level. We have to mean it for women. We have to mean it for all women. We have to mean it for lesbians and for gay men and for trans people and non-binary people. And within that, we have been coming a bit slowly, but nonetheless to the realization that those terms, women and men, and even gay and lesbian and non-binary, they're too big. They're too big, they're too fast. They blot out the particularity of women and the particularity of men within those vast uh, groupings. And I think that's basically what we mean when we talk about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I always think to myself, you're never just a woman. And this is also true of men, but you are never just a woman. You are a woman in a particular context at a particular moment in your life with particular different directions. And it encompasses, therefore, social class, which I think, I'm sure Kathleen will have spoken about, but which we still do not focus enough on the profound class inequalities that we have in this country. It also very clearly, listening to Coletta, you can't miss it. Being here today, you can't miss it. Your ethnicity, your race and your ethnicity are absolutely central in determining what you as a woman can and cannot do in a given place at a given moment uh, in time, whether or not you have a disability, uh, what your sexuality is. And something I'm beginning to discover, I'll be 75 in May, I was obliged to cocoon during um, the first lockdown. I was absolutely outraged because it demonstrated that older people were treated in a way which was frankly discriminatory and which was condescending and patronizing. So, you know, you begin to look at all of the ways in which these multiple social variable, fa variable social factors determine our lives. And I think one of the great learnings that is coming through in the women's movement now and has been for the last, it was, all, it was there, but it is coming through really strongly now is that we cannot just fight for rights for women. We have to fight for right, the rights of particular women in particular circumstances. And these always need to be named. Um, it is, much more than saying we need an inclusive 
politics. Of course, we need an inclusive politics, but we need an inclusive politics which is attentive to the ways in which equality is not enjoyed and is not the right of particular groups uh, of people. Um, and just when I think, of, just say a very quick word and then I will end, Salome, you're probably waving at yes. me now, but just to say on bias and prejudice that, um, you know, the facts and the figures really speak for themselves. When you look across, it's supposed to be about leadership, but when you think about women who are leaders in this country, the women leaders you think of were all white. I don't actually consider myself a leader, but if you look at um, the political sphere, if you look at the business sphere, if you look at the professions, you look at the universities and so on and so forth, women are not doing very well. White women are not doing incredibly well. 22% in the Doyle, okay, it's 40% in, in the Senate, but that's another, another kind of issue. Um, only 24%, I think, in local, in local government. Um, but in fact, the faces are all white. And in fact, this, this last Senate election was the first time that an ethnic minority woman was actually elected to, uh, to the whole of the Oireachtas, Eileen Flynn, who is a traveler woman. But so, you know, those facts should speak for themselves. Those deficits, those absences, those great emissions, uh, should speak for themselves but they don't so we have to shout them out and we have to shout out the reasons why they are there we have to say that there is prejudice there is structural racism there is also structural ableism as far as i know there is no woman with a disability to my knowledge in the Oireachtas at the present time um, and that this is a huge huge problem um, i i you know, was, was very thinking quite a lot over the past few months about the Citizens' Assembly and the Citizens' Assembly on Gender, which is doing very good work. But, you know, I really was very annoyed that that Citizens' Assembly was focusing on gender. I thought this is much too big a topic. What we need to be focusing on is inequality. Maybe we should be focusing on gender and inequality. We should be looking at those uh, those factors in women's lives, which mean that the great big gaps are there. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe what we actually also need immediately is a citizens assembly on racism to actually root that out, as well as, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a proper national action plan against racism, which had which had proper funding, which was going to invest in recruiting and promoting programs that would promote women into women of color into politics in this country. Wouldn't it be great if the political parties had quotas, not only for numbers of women, but specific groupings of women and groupings, actually groupings of women and men and talking about ethnicity, talking about disability, and so on and so forth. Now, I know I've given you all of this in a fierce, fierce rush. I was asked to do an awful lot, but I do want to say to you that I, I think never give up, which is Coletta's mantra, has always been mine. I think it is absolutely crucial for us as women to never give up and always to reach out the hand to the woman beside you, across from you, away from you, wherever she is, work with her, not against her. Be always her ally, even if it's not directly your issue. And with those alliances, I think we can achieve a great deal more than we can if we're divided from one another. Thanks so much for inviting me here today. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alpha. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Catherine Lynch and Dr. Colette. We've actually learned a lot from you and we just need to remind ourselves on what has been achieved because uh, listening to the three of you, it's quite evident that we have achieved quite a lot. Um, and you know that the small fights that you might have thought they are small, they're actually big because they have transformed people's lives. I know like uh, how Dr. Uh, Catherine Lynch um, work has has actually transformed so many people who have actually gone through the Equality Studies, uh, you know, Institute itself, you know, Alpha Smith, and actually rolling out this training to outreach 
where you have reached a lot of women, you know, because I worked with women in Talamo who would not have able, been able to actually end up in UCD or go to any college if this training were not brought into their door, mainly because, you know, the, the, the caring role, as uh, uh, Professor Kadrin actually mentioned earlier, how it, it, it has actually taken a lot of, um, you know, a lot of time and a lot of everything, you know, for women. And somebody mentioned about the, you know, sharing these gender roles, you know, in particular in care and, and, and managing the children and ma managing homes at the same time. I want to ask people to be able to put questions out there. We have 15 minutes. We have had quite a lot. I'm not actually going to repeat um, what has already been said, uh, but it will be important maybe now to enter into a discussion. And I actually start with them. Um, you know, looking into the biases and for the fact that, you know, uh, Professor Catherine Lynch is so much, um, you know, he, her work is so much uh, into education. You know, she have actually invested quite a lot into education and even adding up in UCD and the work that she has done in UCD, championing some campaign and actually challenging the lack of promotion, for example, uh, for women in UCD. I really wanted to ask her, you know, given your work and input in the last 20 years, can you please share with us on what what needs to be done? What do we still need to do? Do you think, uh, for example, like UCD is at a better place in uh, positioning women in terms of promotion and, and having, you know, equality for women? We are, we are seeing this, you know, that we, you spoke about patriarchy as well, um, you know, and this, this whole area of male domination because we didn't need to go back to gender equality like Alpha Smith has said. So what do we do then, you know, for example, in the area of education, overcoming those barriers in terms of uh, positioning women in leadership positions, uh, based on what you have done and what needs to be done, uh, could you actually maybe, um, you know, share with us on your thought on what should be done to have more women uh, leaders in these positions, in particular in the education institutions? Uh, Professor Kadrin Lange. Hey, um, thank you. Thanks, Saluma. I suppose um, I could give you a very factual answer, which is not very exciting. But actually, there have been achievements. I'm not saying they're significant achievements, but we do have in 25, 28 or something percent in UCD who are professors and like about 40 percent who are associate professors. So they're, they're not insignificant achievements. I mean, they were literally half that 25 years ago. Now, I'm not saying that's where it should be because you have over 50% of the women and more of them who have higher education. So that's a long way from where it should be. But I suppose what you do have, um, which is what I've adverted to there is, I have campaigned in recent years, you know, for um, education about minorities to be controlled by minority academic voices. I feel very strongly about that. Starting Black Studies, attempting to start it in UCD, I believe we should have permanent posts in that area and it should be talked by black scholars. I believe we should have, I tried to get that before I retired, but it didn't happen. As a, we should have had an institute that set up black studies, traveler studies, disability studies, all controlled and run by. We have an interesting phenomenon sometimes where you see somebody running a course on something like black scholarship or something and it's a white man. I, would you have a course on Women nowadays, that is raw, uh, taught by men uh, entirely, nothing else. But I think that there are a lot of questions, and travelers are like an interesting cultural phenomenon for a lot of academics, for whom about whom they make their livelihood. Because the position of travelers in Irish society is almost as bad as it was 20 years ago. 15 years less men have, and life expectancy of women 11 years less. They have seven to 10 times the rate of suicide. So. I think that what I'd say is we need to be exemplary and actually to create positions. That's what I'm saying. Because a lot of the time, women, going back to what Alva said, women with disabilities or men with disabilities or women or men from minority positions are not able to compete on the terms that are set because they do not come from a cultural milieu of privilege, resources, time, investment. They don't. And so you are not going to have. And I think if you're not have a plan, you have to have a strategic plan. And it needn't be a quota, you have to invest in their education. For example, postdoctoral scholarships for women who are black and women for carers. For example, there were the um, EU and Ireland ran these programs for postdoctoral scholarships. It expects you to run around Europe like a migrant worker with, as if you were a, a bachelor boy, as I said. That's what they think you are, a bachelor boy with no commitments, no ties, no cultural 
a belonging somewhere as if you, so many women who have children and who are young in their 30s, they're not eligible for any because they can't move. And so I think there are a lot of issues like that at a very, if you like, structural level, Leomi is, is what I'm talking about. But women achieve. There's no problem with women achieving. And that's, I suppose, what I was saying there earlier on. Achieve. But once we know the data for women, once they have children, their patient rate drops. We don't have proper childcare services, as I've uh, referred to them. We don't. We don't have proper RevPie services. Mm. A privatised, uh, a state subsidised childcare system, which is a pay as you go system, which we have the highest well, in Europe, the most expensive childcare. So I think that we have a long way to go if we're going to get women. And although I have to say it is with reservation, I say this because women are not per se are not virtuous. I want idealistic women. I want women like Alba and others to be in this. I don't want women who behave like men in the patriarchal mm. positions of authority. And unfortunately, without having a proactive campaign, I think we often end up with people who are clones of those who are already in power and who do not fight for those who come behind. So I think you need to be very wary of what you wish for. For example, should be a study done in Ireland of where a lot of professors who come in now who hold professorships in our universities who are I mean, at senior level who are not from Ireland. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it means that Irish women are not getting promoted. But mm -hmm. the figures belie what's happening to Irish women because often, for example, we don't have the so if you're in the arts, humanities and social sciences, there's virtually no funding for you for most people. At uh, to do PhDs and everything else. So you often end up doing it part-time, you have to work. Mm. We all know, I'm writing a paper on it from research, that women actually can't compete then. They can't compete. And we have an international competition, so you're not really on the radar. And that indeed is happening to a lot of Irish men as well. It's not only a women's issue, because we have... So I'd love to see women in leadership. I think, I suppose in education, I feel the education itself needs to be I really do believe we should have an a gender inequality racism module in every degree program. I think it should not be like, oh, if you want to do women's studies or equality studies. It should be in Sweden, as you know, it's mandatory. Mm. In degree programs, there's something you have to study. And I believe that that should be true here. Otherwise, you need to change the curricula. You need to look at what's in the curricula as well. It's a very much a bigger issue than simply having um, you know, faces that are different in that because if women don't behave differently, they don't start to, as Alva said, coalesce and join. And I've been surprised, to be honest with you, since the last 10 years, how neoliberal capitalism and its value of academic capitalism has taken over the university. Mm -hmm. And it's meant that a lot of people are putting their career above all else. And the mobilization that Alva and I did and to establish and other women in our time, it's not happening. And I think that reflects a new academic capitalism where your career and your own personal advantage is heavily rewarded. It's not the individuals, but that is what is rewarded. And I think that's a bigger issue than just a gender issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I think, you know, there's still so much to work on. And actually, this put us back to where we spoke about, you know, um, uh, creating RIS and, and keeping our differences aside to be able to achieve, like how we have achieved, you know, so far uh, up to, to where we are now. And we really need to continue, you know, working together to be able to name out these issues the way we are naming them now and naming the challenges and, and also those biases which are still existing in whether it's in the area of education, whether it's the institutions that we have that are still very much bureaucratic and hid us women in, a, in engaging in any meaningful way. But just going to Alpha Smith herself, I think uh, Coletta has gone. She actually had a lecture at three, so she might have gone. But I'll go to you, um, Alpha. And actually, my question, which I direct to you now, is on the same line of biases and, and challenges, but really looking at the physical integrity. You know, we've heard how you have fought for divorce, for issues of violence against women, the reappeal, the Eighth Amendment. But where are we now, you know, when we look at, you know, the reproductive rights of women, because their value is so very important, uh, in particular in um, helping the woman to be able to, to shape her future and to know uh, how she will actually position herself. Where are we with that? Where What are the biases that we have now? Does it mean by achieving the reappeal, the aid, now we have the road to abortion that we have, we have it all? Are there still biases? Are there still challenges that are still there that we need to work on? 
Sorry. Yes, um, Salome, I do think that there is still a very great deal to fight for. And indeed, as with everything one gains, you also have to make sure that you hold on to what you have won. And particularly with world politics the way it is today, I do think that we have to be very careful to not to have what we have gained taken away. Um, that is a risk. It's happening in other countries in Poland at the moment, for example, where women who did originally have rights to abortion are now completely denied those rights and are having to struggle to, re to regain them. And that has to do with particular political formation, which is very far to the right, as we know. So I think that that's one problem. But just looking at, uh, if we think about repeal of the Eighth Amendment, that was specifically about taking out of the Constitution an obstacle to women's uh, freedom. So it, it, it was making, it was opening up the way for not just legislation, but also for the provision, and most importantly, for the provision of services that women could um, avail of to exercise their reproductive rights fully. So it was really quite interesting. And as we know, we had the referendum, which was about removing the eighth. And alongside that, there sat a law, which did um, give us, I think, more than we might have expected back in 2012, when you and I and many others came together to fight uh, for repeal. We did get a 12-week period um, of abortion effectively on request where a woman doesn't have to provide a, a reason. After 12 weeks, it is really, it, it's very difficult for women to access, any woman, it's very difficult for her to access abortion in this country. It's extremely limited, only if there is a serious risk to her health or in the case of a fatal fetal anomaly, with the result that many women um, are still traveling to Britain, which of course assumes that you have the resources assumes that you have the money to make this journey, assumes that you can take time off work, assumes that you can find childcare, also assumes that you're not in um, perhaps a, a difficult abusive relationship um, where you will, assumes you're in a situation where you'll have the support of your partner and so on and so forth. So that is a huge problem. And even prior to 12 weeks, there are, as we know, um, difficulties with the three-day regulation which says yes you will go to your uh, doctor go to your gp and say i want an abortion the doctor has to say yes can't say no because that is your right but the doctor uh, is obliged under the terms of the law to say to you yes well but now i want you to go home for three days and come back and tell me the same thing on the third day and we've discovered during covid uh, that the system was well able to do this via telemedicine, um, either online or even on the telephone. So, you know, changes can, can happen. But those fundamental restrictions are there. But the, mm. the gravest restrictions are, I think, where the provision of services lie. At the moment, under 400 general practitioners, GPs in this country, uh, explicitly provide um, abortion for women in the first nine weeks of, of pregnancy. Um, and there are something like 3,000 general practitioners in this country, not enough actually, but you know, 400, you can see that there is a gap. Now, I think within that other cohort of doctors who haven't said anything explicitly, that many of them do, but they're not, they don't feel safe to come forward and say we do, either because they may be subjected to um, uh, anti-abortion uh, campaigners mm -hmm. outside their clinics or their, sur their surgeries and so on and so forth, or because they themselves just don't mm -hmm. quite feel um, that they, they can do that. We also have a, a conscience, a so-called conscience clause, which is really a refusal clause, the right to, to refuse uh, to, to, to conduct. So they're, they're, you know, they're really, and, and furthermore, actually big point I meant to say, only 11 of our 19 maternity hospitals have the full spectrum of um, abortion procedure uh, uh, services available for women. So that in many cases, women, 
if they're over the nine weeks will have mm. to travel to a hospital elsewhere. So, you know, we see that what we have is not so much an abortion law as a law which is, uh, let's limit abortion. Mm law. So we hope when the review of the law comes up in a year and a half's time and many organisations and groups are, um, you know, I'm involved in that, are undertaking, like yourselves and Akitwa, reviews of that uh, situation. And I mean, similarly, I would say that with the marriage equality referendum, it was, you know, it really, it broke through that terrible sexual repressiveness of Ireland just as I think repeal broke through that repressiveness and oppression of, of women in ways that are, you know, quite startling and stark. But if you think about that, I mean, there is still homophobia and there is undoubtedly transphobia in this country. And that is experienced even by very young people, by kids at school, for example. So a referendum doesn't, even if you win quite generously, mm -hmm doesn't solve all of the, the problems. So you always have to keep on fighting. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Alpha. And I just want to come back to that, uh, you know, to the last question, the final one before we wrap up. And it will actually, you know, go into the whole area of intersectionality. You have mentioned, for example, trans, and then, you know, the, 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 all, whatever is going on now, but we didn't need to talk about that before we finish, you know, in particular on intersectionality and also bringing migrant women, in particular black women and women of color, and uh, how they still struggle to fit into the women movement, for example, and into their own going of what you call the women leadership but uh, i wanted actually to uh, be able to answer one of the questions from a lady called confidence and she's asking how much has been done to support women coming out of direct provision and trying to integrate successively into the Irish society. Uh, just to say that from a kiddo point of view, uh, we know that you know, there are organizations out there, including the Irish Refugee Council um, and others that have actually been assigned to help women to look for housing. There have been a lot of issues as well as we know, you know, getting houses is very difficult at this time because of uh, not only the lockdown, but uh, you know, the, the, the scarcity of the houses or housing. Um, so there are organizations that are supporting that are out there. Uh, some of them are voluntary organizations that help just, uh, you know, they're in helping. Some of them are supported by the state to be able to do that. Um, and actually in Akidwa, you know, we do support people with reference letter for houses, reference letter for job. We also have a project which is going on now, which is called the Door to Work, and that is actually putting women into uh, the labor market. But I just want to say that I don't think we are doing enough to be able to integrate migrants in, in, the, in the society. We need to do more, uh, the community groups that we have there and the organizations that are out there, they need to be able to welcome uh, people more because even when we talk about leadership, leadership starts at the local level. And if we don't really welcome and um, bring everybody along or actually engage others or include, because also choose to challenge for this year, which is the International Women's Day uh, theme, also remind us that we have to be inclusive. Um, and that actually bring me to, my final question, which I want uh, both Alpha and Carol Catherine to maybe respond, and it's in, in relation to uh, intersectionality. Uh, we heard even from the very beginning that, you know, when we talk about women, we are not talking about, uh, you know, uh, just one group of women. You know, we, you know, there's diversity among women, uh, you know, and also we have uh, this intersectionality of women who could be, you know, she's a woman of color, she's uh, disabled, and she's of a different faith. But also, you know, we have, um, you know, with trans women, we have people from, uh, you know, gay and lesbian community as well. So how, how do we actually move forward in the women movement and actually uh, bring others along with us in that an enabling environment uh, with the, without leaving anyone behind? So how do we work out, you know, through this actually a process of, uh, you know, recognizing the intersectionality? Because I think it's a huge thing and it's true to say that, you know, one style doesn't fit at all. Um, so uh, what is your thought on that and bringing, you know, other women, because we've also heard from Coletta on the issues of, of racism and discrimination. What would be your uh, highlights on this, uh, Catherine? Well, I think uh, I actually wrote a, when I was on the Constitution Review Group, which is now 25 years ago, 1996, that when we are including people in terms of any positions or uh, 
whether it was in that case it was the Senate, but we didn't use the word exintectionality, but we used the word that every group should be disaggregated and should by their differences within them and they should be represented. So I feel very strongly about it actually, because I think there is a danger, as I think a number of people would say, like that, yes, there have been gains, but gains for who? Middle class women, uh, for middle class women particularly, because a lot of them are in the professions, where there's, for example, take even something like parental leave. If you get parental leave and you're on low wages, or your employer in the private sector doesn't decide not to give it to you, or you can't take it, you can't take the extra leave. So there have been a lot of, Alva talked about the gains in terms of abortion. There were similar issues in other areas. So I feel any organization that claims to represent women or whatever they are, they must recognize within that and have a look to see a profile of who is in this organization. How have we built it into our constitution to ensure, for example, that women with disabilities, ethnic minority women, traveler women are represented? It's not the science. I mean, you can't do it. You know, when we set out in equality studies in the probably from the 2010 world to increase the number of black students, we proactively campaigned to get them. We proactively went out there. You know, it doesn't happen. And I've always said that in the university, unless you have a plan, we are going to do this. We are going to attempt to recruit people in X, Y, and Z places. And you need to build that into the constitution of your organization if you claim to represent women, for example. Otherwise, it won't happen. And you need a checklist to make sure it is happening and a monitoring and, you know, sanctioning a review of yourselves. If, if you haven't a plan, it's not going to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And it's true, we have to proactively get out there and get people involved. Alpha? Yes, well, I mean, I, I very much agree with Kathleen. And I think if I'm just thinking about legislation at the moment, one of the things I've been saying for in, in talks this, this week around International Women's Day is that actually, you know, we do have this call for all legislation to be gender proofed and for budgets to be gender proofed. And, I think it's really important for us to say actually that's not enough that's not detailed enough that there is a kind of I hate I, I'm very nervous of that word diversity because it's often so completely hollow you know it's got nothing in it but there is something about having the checklist that Kathleen talks about for laws which actually checks along the lines of uh, socioeconomic class uh, ethnicity distrokeability age, uh, sexuality, and, and so on and so forth. I'm sure I'm forgetting things there. Uh, but I think that there is really a huge challenge for women's organizations um, to, to do that internally and in relation to all of their uh, activities. And I, I think it is a challenge which women's organizations, which I'm familiar with, are, are actually grappling with and are beginning to respond to. But what I would say is that what's been particularly interesting over the past couple of years in Ireland, maybe since the big campaigns, I, I don't, I, I think that may have something to do with it. And particularly over the past several months, undoubtedly since the Black Lives Matter movement in the US after the, the murder of, of uh, George Floyd, I think that what we're seeing is a real vigor and energy and determination and insistence from the voices of women in uh, groups and communities that have been marginalized and disadvantaged and basically uh, omitted and reduced to kept in, in, in silence. Um, and I think there is, there is a recognition on the one hand in the organizations that there is not a level playing field and something has to be done. And on the other hand, you have women actually standing up and shouting and say actually it's not good enough we're not in there we, we don't feature there where are we what are you doing about this and raising um those voices uh, raising their voices and making their demands which is i suppose what you could call intersectionality in action um and i think that there is increasing recognition across the board that this has to be done and i've been really very 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 struck by this over the past nine months or so, and particularly over the past six months, um, that uh, I, I think that 
the big organizations are making efforts. But I think that that's also because women, you know, are just not keeping quiet. And whether that's because they're women of color or whether it's because they're women with a disability, for example, is they're saying, look here, uh, we've had enough of not being around the table. And we want to be. And I think that that, that point uh, came, came home very strongly to women right across the country when we noticed and realized that we weren't around the COVID-19 decision-making tables, at least certainly not visibly on television. And I think women, all kinds of women, began to raise their voices and say, this is absolutely not good enough. And it gave a new kind of dynamism to all of that, which is why I am annoyed about the Citizens' Assembly, not with the way it's being conducted, which is very fair and very good, but the fact that it was chosen to be on gender without thinking through what needed to happen in relation to gender and that you can't talk about gender now without understanding that gender is crisscrossed in all of these complex ways that have to be taken into consideration if there is to be any equality of outcome for women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alpha. And actually, um, maybe resonate with what you have said, you know, towards the very end uh, on, on why we need to speak more, why we need to be on the table on where the decisions are being made. And I think all the women who are listening this afternoon, the importance of being on the table where decisions are being made, the importance of getting out there and actually, you know, having your voice heard, which is very important. Uh, and I think, Lida, we have learned quite a lot on where we have come, you know, as, as, as women, uh, globally in Ireland and actually within our own self on how far we have come. And as I said at the beginning, Ireland has been looked upon as a, as a country which has actually demonstrated a very uh, good, it's a good role model in particular for women. But this actually had to bring some women on the forefront, you know, to take leadership. And Alpha Smith has one, been one of them. Uh, Catherine Lynch has been one of them and Coletta as well, you know, in Dundalk. So we all have responsibility to transform the world, you know, in our own way as women. We know women have been on the forefront of the pandemic you know, they've been actually doing the caring work, you know, majority of them and Catherine actually did share some of the statistics. We also know that, you know, the pandemic continued to impact so hugely on women. We know of, uh, you know, violence, domestic violence, which has increased during this time of pandemic, but also the huge role that the women have taken, you know, as a um, home, you know, they're, they're doing homeschooling and supporting children at this time when there's actually lockdown until now the schools have gone back and they'll be going back fully soon. So we have come to the end of our webinar this afternoon. I want to acknowledge, you know, our chair who is with us, Ashimedua Okonko. Ashimedua has her own farm as well. She's a woman leader in Ireland, a migrant woman leader who have set up a very good example and continue to fight for many women who need legal assistance and legal services so I want to acknowledge her presence here, but I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the, all the effort that has been put by the staff of Akidwa, Alana, Caroline, uh, Yuriko, they all know themselves because most of them are in this um, uh, webinar. So it's really to thank everybody and to say that we will be putting this, um, the recording of this uh, webinar into our website so you can see it. I'm also reminding you, we are actually in our 20th anniversary, two decades of great work and achievement, and we are going to ask you to follow us on our master classes and actually sharing about our wisdom of the 20 years, which we are calling the melting pot. So we hope to communicate more with you. We hope um, to be able to transform the world together. And definitely, we will be involved in many campaigns. We will work like um, the way, you know, Catherine has actually given us some of the tips that we should take away with us, being organized and working together, but being organized, creating allies and keeping our differences because it doesn't mean that you agree every time um, but also uh, you know to make sure that we put our voice out there and we work together to achieve the very best for future generations and for all of us so thank you very much and have a very good afternoon thank you thank you, thank you Salome and everybody involved <laughs> thank you. Thank you.